Hey, welcome everybody. Um, and thank you for being here bright and early at 9 a.m. Um, I'm actually in Johannesburg where it's not raining and the sun is shining, although it's freezing. Um, but uh, welcome to this webinar. I think it's my fourth for the year. Um, today, what I'm going to try and do is give you a slightly, um, let's call it longer term uh, reflection of South Africa's 30 years after democracy, but where I see structurally at least some of the challenges, economic challenges, um, playing themselves out um, and the extent to which, and uh, uh, of course, with the government of national unity in place, it's an almost an ideal vantage point to be thinking about policy options uh, with a little bit more, let's call it political flexibility um, within within cabinet. So, so I'll really have a three-part story. One is um, uh, what I call my growth reflections in three charts to think about South Africa's growth record, again, from 94, using um, uh, three uh, charts, as it were, to try and think about how to reflect growth uh, using the same data, but what that tells us about the trajectory and the nature and the level of growth. But then I want to step back a little bit because there's a lot of short run, let's call it from from uh, particularly, um, you know, sort of, uh, let's say, uh, investment analysts from the private banking community and so on, which we, who have to focus on short term growth uh, issues to step back a little bit and say, is our growth trajectory um, uh, energized in the correct manner. In other words, to generate the kinds of economic growth that uh, we see in Asia. And I want to suggest that um, there are various elements of the growth trajectory and the low growth we've had uh, that that are going to provide huge challenges going forward. And then I want to turn to what I call um, a sort of key policy shifts and a few policy ideas. These are not the only ones, uh, that uh, that government needs to be thinking about, and slightly non-traditional, if you like. So let's just look at South Africa's growth record, three charts. The first chart is probably the one you've seen before. So this just lines up South Africa against a whole series of emerging markets um, um, and tries to ask the question, well, let's take the time period that is specific to us, which is the post-democratic period, 94 to 2022, and what is South Africa's uh, GDP growth rate on a per capita basis, average annual, look like for this period, the 30 years of democracy, just about, compared to other emerging markets. You'll notice here, I'm not interested in advanced countries. I only want to look at countries that are at the similar stage of development as us. So I've got mainly middle-income countries from Colombia to Peru, Malaysia, Turkey, and so on. Essentially, South Africa is in red at the bottom of the class, right? So just think about this. Over the 30-year period, South Africa has been growing at an average annual real GDP per capita growth rate of 1.2%. So that's 1.2% every year for this period, which is close on 30 years. Compare that, right, to a China, right, that's been growing close on 8% every year for close to 30 years. That's the kind of growth momentum you really need. And of course, China is well known, but look at the others at the top end. You've got uh, Vietnam. Um, I think you've heard me say this before. Vietnam is sort of my favorite uh, frontier economy, the next China in my view. Vietnam's been growing at 5.4% every year, right, for the last uh, 30 years. Um, India as well. You've got economies that that also have macro instability like Turkey, but they're growing, they're growing persistently and, and consistently well, right? So Turkey, for example, at three and a half percent. So the, the first growth challenge we have and lies at the core of South Africa being in what is called the middle income country growth trap lies in the fact that we've been growing uh, at a rate that's far too slow for far too long. And it's as simple as that. But the second growth chart is perhaps the one that I produced about actually a year ago already. Um, um, and I've sort of been finding a, a way in which to introduce it into a, a storyline about growth. And that's to compare it across the political era. And that's really where I'll feed into the kind of growth uh, trajectory you've had and the nature of the growth trajectory. Um, if you look at the three eras, right, essentially the ones that are 
core is the Zuma versus the Thabo Mbeki era. And what's very clear is that during the Mbeki era, we grew at 4.2% per year, right? Every year. During the, uh, right up to the cusp of his second term, at the end of his second term. In the Zuma years, right? If you needed, if you needed a metric for the difference between the Mbeki and the Zuma years, just look at growth rates, right? The growth rates don't lie. And in the Zuma years, growth collapsed. Growth uh, collapses to 1.45% per year um, throughout the period. And remember, yes, the global financial crisis occurred, but most other emerging markets recovered very, very quickly after that. We didn't. And so, but what lies behind that, and it's really important to think about this, is that the ANC uh, government under Mbeki was a government focused on macro stability. You remember we had Tito Mboweni, Trevor Manuel, and Thabo Mbeki, the three TMs, as they called, were the axis of economic policy through the Reserve Bank, through the National Treasury, and through the presidency. They pursued a very clear, um, austere macro policy combined with uh, attempts to encourage growth. That then delivered declining unemployment rates, and you even see that in uh, growth rates in employment, right? The highest in the period, or unemployment rates were the lowest in that Mbeki era. And significant work and improvements happen in welfare. What what um, uh, micro applied microeconomists in South Africa, re when we refer to welfare, we refer to housing, energy, water, social assistance. All that begins to be delivered in the beginning of the Mandela era and onto the Mbeki era. But in the second term of Mbeki, we are ready to deliver what we call the second phase of um, economic development. And that's to get to improving conditions for firms, maybe deregulating the labor market and so on. And so we're on the cusp actually of um, the second phase of the economic inclusion program, if you like. But instead, we know what happened, right? So instead what happens is you get um, Zuma coming to power on the back of an apparent um, uh, view that Mbeki is too right-wing and so on. But of course, all that Zuma was was a thief, right? And so begins the era that we all know too well as um, state capture. What that does, crucially, so I won't go through what the consequences of state capture were and the collapse in infrastructure and so on, but uh, what that does is to forestall uh, the reform program. So the second phase um, of the Mbeki era, which may have led to an alternative president, perhaps even Cyril Ramaphosa instead of uh, Jacob Zuma, um, would have then seen the launch pad or the, the foundations being laid to launch the second phase of, the, um, of our uh, economic inclusion program. So that's lost because deficits and debt come down nicely on the Mbeki era. Um, revenues coming in, all the right noises are made with the private sector, unemployment starts falling, welfare is pushed back, and so we were ready to actually uh, kick on, but but that has failed. So that's that's a really crucial other lens. Apart from the lo low growth rate, which is the first ch uh, chart, the second chart, same data, but just keep in mind what the policy, the parallel policy program looked like in that period. But the third growth chart, and that's the, th the, the same, da same data, if you like, but now only looking at the last year, is the one that actually reflects on the cost of state capture. So if you take the Mbeki era, I've given you that sort of 1% growth rate or the collapse in growth, and now I ask the question, well, what has been the cost? And that cost lies in our GDP growth projection for this year. I think it's data you may have seen in the monthly signals as well. Um, but we know if we look at the different macro models which are presented here, right, whether it's the Investec model, the OECD model, the Saab model, the BER model, IMF, the blue gives you the projected growth rate for South Africa um, for 2024. It's clear, um, excuse me, um, it's clear that South Africa's growth rate on average across the model should be at about 1.3%. Um, at the median, that's about 1%. So we're not, we I mean, just keep in mind, that's the same as our 30-year period. So we're back to where we started. But this time I would argue, right, that it's a lot to do with the consequences of a state capture. How do I measure that? Well, I looked at 2021 world growth rates compared to South Africa, or let's say emerging markets compared to South Africa in 2021, Right, so before we see a true collapse in infrastructure, and 
Uh, emerging markets, EMs were growing at about 1.4, let's call it 1.5 times faster than us, right? 1.5 times faster than us before true infrastructure collapse. Now in 2024, EMs are growing 5.7 times faster than us in 2024. That ratio of difference from 1.5 to 5.7, right? Let's make it six, is effectively, because remember, the entire world economy on the back of post-COVID uh, slowdown is actually doing, is not doing that well, right? China's slowed down and many EMs have slowed down. Argentina's in crisis. Um, and, and as a consequence, the growth rates in EMs are struggling. So that difference has got nothing to do with anything except right? The fact that infrastructure has collapsed in South Africa. It's a pure domestic own goal, if you like, right? And so if you ask the question, well, if South Africa would be uh, would have grown at a rate similar to the 2021 figures, what would our growth rate look like? And that's the red bar. So the red bar reflects, let's take those same models, right? And I just apply a ratio and I say, well, according, for example, according to the IMF model, instead of growing at 1.8%, if we had 2021 differentials to EMs, we'd be growing at 5.4%. That is the cost of state capture, just in one graph, right? Or, or the, 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 the cost, if you like, of an infrastructure backlog. And so in many senses, that for me represents a, a key sort of reflection of um, the cost of growth in, in um um, in the South African context. So let me let me um, reflect now on um, what I would call the outcomes from economic growth um, in the context of these three charts, right? So you've often seen broad pictures of shorter term effects, but I want to step back a little bit. What South Africa has done, right, is effectively, and, and, and this chart has a lot of detail behind it, but effectively the growth trajectory in simple terms in South Africa is um, modulated in the following, following way. There's low growth that's generated. There's a revenue base um, uh, that, that uh, or, or there's revenue that's generated from this growth and the revenue has to go somewhere. It can go to consumption expenditure from the fiscus or it can go to capital expenditure. In essence, the argument I make is that we spend far more than most other EMs on social security. How do you think about that? What you see is a state that's a realized multidimensional poverty decline. So there's a lot of spending that's gone on housing and on health, um, which is very common, education and so on. We'll talk about the effectiveness of that spending a little bit later. But far more has gone on social security or social assistance, as it's commonly known, relative to other um, uh, similar countries. So what does the data show? And that's the graph on the left. I just look at spending on what in the international literature is called social assistance or what you would call, what we would call social grants, right? Child support grant, old age pension. We are the 10th highest spender on social assistance in the world. Remember in the emerging markets world, right? We, one of the lowest growing um, economies uh, in that sample in our emerging market world, if you like, yet in the entire um, uh, world economy we're the 10th highest spender on social assistance. In fact, we are much higher than economies that are uh, similar to ours. Argentina only spends 2.1% of social assistance uh, as a share of GDP on social assistance. Mexico, India, Brazil, China, all these key economies that we would aspire to be, and some of which actually don't grow that very fast, um, much faster than us, are spending far, more, far less on social assistance. So the problem or the challenge has been, and I'll get again, I'll get to how one reverses this focus, right? But the challenge has been is that we've got this growth trajectory that is essentially driven by an attempt to, yes, big tick spend on education, housing, health, assuming it's effective and so on, but spending far too much on a poverty alleviation strategy that depends on social assistance. Um, and and we know that it's too much because we're one of the highest spenders in the world on this, right? There is also work, which I don't talk about here, from the World Bank, which shows that we far we are far more costly um, uh, a spender, right, of social assistance. So it costs far more than the average emerging market to disperse these funds um, to poor households, and that's also a challenge. Um, so effectively, 
Um, the pillar of our poverty reduction strategy lies not in generating jobs through the private sector. Again, that's something I'll come to a bit later, but rather um, on increasing the reach and the value of social assistance. But the problem with that is contingent on revenue from growth, right? And so when growth stalls, which is the current position we in, right, particularly during the COVID years, right, revenue declines. So deficits are effectively funding social assistance commitments. And that's kind of the, um, if you like, the social assistance corner we find ourselves in and unable to find an alternative growth trajectory. And growth itself hasn't been helped by what is called, and South Africa is no different from many other emerging markets, incidentally. So in case you think this is uh, this chart in particular is a South Africa specific story, it's not. So we're struggling with what is known as premature deindustrialization, right? So often, uh, in fact, most economies since the great industrial revolution, Japan and so on, right through to China and now Vietnam, will um, pursue a development strategy from middle to high income status through manufacturing. Uh, so um, industrialization, if you like, leads the process of economic development. What you have in South Africa and in other emerging markets is the breakdown of this model. Manufacturing is not delivering the low wage employment growth that you wanted to, to kick you on to high income country status. So what do we have here? We have change in employment. I'll just take you through this graph. It's called the sort of structural transformation graph. So you want to be here with high employment. The larger the circle, these are by sectors, the larger the circle, the larger the share of employment. So what you'll see, for example, is agriculture. We've seen a decline in employment and I've got on the vertical axis, I've got uh, effectively a measure of uh, multi-factor productivity. So this would suggest that you've got declining productivity in agriculture and declining employment, right? Um, what you have in mining is a really good example of how to think about this is a high productivity sector, right? Uh, in terms of being capital intensive um, relative to total productivity in the economy, but it's negative in terms of employment. So employment's contracting. So what you want to be is lots of sectors over here, particularly those that are large employers. Here's our problem. Manufacturing is a relatively in absolute terms, large employer, but is actually shedding jobs and is not very productive. Where's our growth impetus coming from? It's essentially coming from financial and business services, which is not a large employer, hence the circle is small. It's a large, uh, sorry, it's, a, it's, a, it's generating lots of jobs in terms of change, but it's an, in absolute terms, not a large employer, hence the circle is small, but it's very productive. And so essentially what you've got is a growth pattern in South Africa, where uh, the trajectory of growth is driven by high productivity in services oriented sectors like financial and business services, transport and communication, which are, which are okay in terms of employment generation, but are not really hitting the button uh, in terms of mass employment uh, generation through a sector like manufacturing, right? Even wholesale and retail trade, which is down here, is generating employment, but it's not very productive. And most, a lot of those jobs um, uh, tend to be um, not, not, not tend to be growth drivers. So we're in this, um, we're in this uh, growth trajectory where ap we are absent a low wage labor intensive pattern of economic growth. And that then attenuates, it influences, it drives um, inequality in the society, right? So what you want in an economic sense is large numbers of either low wage, and I'll come to this later, or um, low earnings. So you don't doesn't have to be a formal sector job, but low earnings so that people move from being unemployed, zero earners, to some level of employment or some level of earnings, then starts reducing or narrowing the income differentials we find in the society. But, but that's very difficult to do when you have a growth trajectory that looks like this. Um, and often we talk about a labor market that is struggling to create jobs, right? And I think that's, so So the best way to provide a snapshot of that is through, um, and so just to go back again, right? The outcomes that you get from low growth, unlike a China and a Vietnam, if you think of that first chart, the outcomes you get is insufficient employment growth, right? And so what we effectively seeing is um, employment levels that are, um, uh, are not sufficiently high 
uh, and consistent, in fact, with an economy that's growing too slowly. So how poor was the employment record or the labor market um, performance? Well, so I've given you some data here, right? So you can you can you can sort of spin it the way you want to, but I think full information is really important. So what we see is over the period of 94 to 2023, 7 million jobs were generated, right? So you see employment goes from 9.5 to 16.5. Yes, great. 7, 7 million jobs generated since democracy. The problem is the one down here. So if you can see my cursor, it's that number there. That number is the labor force, right? And uh, we can go to, don't have time to talk about definitions, but I call it the na narrow labor force. But effectively, you've got um, a labor force growing at 12 and a half million. What that means is even though the economy's created 7 million jobs, over the same period, 12 and a half million people have entered the labor market in search of jobs. And therefore, the difference represents those who cannot find a job, right? And essentially, you've seen this growth in unemployment of about five and a half million. If you wanted a different way to think about that, I've got a little number here that I calculate for these estimates called the employment absorption rate. What that tells you is in summary version, right, of the hundred, for every hundred people that entered the labor force in 1994 continuously, right, until 2023, for every hundred of those people, only 56.3 of them actually found a job of any form in the formal or the informal sector. I want you to keep that number in mind because it's really important when we think about and we think out of the box about employment generation and growth in the South African context. So what you get Again, from that three-chart version of low growth, whether it's state capture, whether it's going further back to, um, um, uh, if you like, the Zuma, Becky relative to the Mandela errors, or whether it's just a pure um, structural transformation problem, so premature deindustrialization, and so you get low growth rates, the outcome tends to be uh, very similar, which is insufficient employment generation. And so poor that we still have one of the highest unemployment rates in the world. And remember that the way in which the state has decided to resolve this welfare challenge is not only education and housing and so on, which are necessary social backlogs, but it's only, if you like, economic to some extent, um, economic or socioeconomic response out of outside of social services is to use social uh, assistance grants as the response to minimize the impacts of low growth on poverty. That's a really important point, right? So, so the the our our growth um, our growth policy right is anchored around a very heavy and strong focus on social assistance. Really important. But the question must be, have we gone too far? And, and I'll talk to that a little bit later in the policy options. But one key outcome from poor growth and persistently poor growth, and one that begins to um, hasten and pick up pace in the Zuma, eras, uh, Zuma era, um, is of course um, debt levels of, uh, that the economy faces and is essentially the fiscus has to deal with. So what you've seen, and I'll give you a few figures here, is our debt to GDP ratio um, starts increasing dramatically. And I want you to keep in mind that it goes from 51 to about 70% as a hangover from the Zuma state capture years, when we saw the wanton destruction of the balance sheets of every single state-owned enterprise. Absolutely shocking development over a short period of time. So effectively what happens, right, is that the debt to GDP ratio uh, rises dramatically right, over a very short time period. And in fact, that's a quote from the National Treasury that our, our um, uh, gross loan debt as a share of GDP is now at its highest point since 1947. Just keep that in mind, right? So as a share of GDP, um, we're doing the worst we've ever done um, in about 50 years, right? Um, or 70 years. Um, what's not shown here is um, the schedule of debt payments, right? Um, and so what, what we do find, if you look more deeply into this um, schedule of debt payments, um, uh, is that there's these massive lump sum payments due, right? As a lot of the uh, debt becomes due over the next four years. Um, and essentially, um, this is a deep, deep focus for National Treasury at the moment. 
The problem, though, is that this deficit uh, um, forces or this rising deficit forces Treasury in the first instance to almost go back to the end of the Mandela era, if you like, which is the, where the Trevor Manuel era begins, which say, OK, our first order of business is to reduce the deficit or the debt to GDP ratio. And that's the focus, which is essentially to move on this path over just keep in mind that's a 10-year period right from 74 percent as a debt to gdp ratio to um to about 67 percent what that does though because the focus is on reducing um debt to gdp ratios is that effectively you'd be deficit financing any attempts to drive growth right and that then it's not something that the so so uh, national treasury is definitely not going to be looking at increasing this debt to gdp ratio to finance growth and so effectively narrows the opportunity for uh, using the state as an instrument for growth i wanted to show you this graph because it suggests that the outcome from growth is long run and um it's a, not an easy route out if you look at this figure where we currently so if you compare us to other middle-income countries, our debt levels are incredibly elevated, right? And so much higher than most other middle-income countries. Um, yet, why this is important is that even if we, if I go back, even if we get to that 67% from, um, in terms of the Treasury's 10-year uh, path, as it were, at 67%, we basically move below Kenya, right? In the rankings, based on this data here. So in other words, we're still above the median or the mean for middle-income countries in terms of debt-to-GDP ratio. So our fiscal journey is a long one. This is not a short turnaround. Of course, it can change, and it can change dramatically, right, um, with much, much higher levels of GDP, right? Um, so what are the options apart from high, higher levels of GDP, which then reduce the debt ratio and so on, right? And then, of course, give you more room, uh, degrees of freedom fiscally, actually, to spend on other stuff. The other is you use the same fiscal envelope and you increase the efficiency of spending. So the, there are routes out of this, but you do need to uh, reduce wastage. So hence, the fight on corruption is not just a political fight, right? It's a fiscal fight, because what you want to make sure of is that you have sufficient funding um, to um to to um uh, to finance what is now the same ask right on across all departments from housing to social assistance but with uh, lower revenue so the best way to do that is to tighten your wealth right and there is some evidence of it but i think uh, that's where the gnu and the new ministers will essentially um um, um provide alternatives hopefully to what we've seen in the past Capital versus consumption expenditure. So you, you've seen my view that our growth trajectory has been too heavily um, built on a consumption trajectory. So in other words, social assistance is what drives um, uh, support to the unemployed or drives um, uh, the link to welfare provisioning. And the argument is, and the argument should be, I think, as I'll show that later, that you need to be thinking more about firms. You need to be moving towards away from consumption expenditure towards capital expenditure. Um, and, and that could just be things like wage subsidies or um, uh, sub capital subsidies to firms and so on. And that then realizes greater returns on growth. But I do want to talk about what poor outcomes from growth also do in terms of what I call our second order challenges that we face. So, and, and, and I want to emphasize this because I think there's too much of a sort of, let's call it superficial analysis of the kinds of um, uh, uh, socioeconomic achievements or challenges we've, we've had in the past. So you often hear the fact that, you know, you know, if you look at telecommunications, South Africa's compared to other middle income countries or even the rest of Africa, we've got, you know, over 100% cell phone ownership and telecommunications coverage is really high and so on. Um, but if you're starting to think about economic inclusion, so in other words, a growth path that is high, so you have very high levels of growth, but you're including more and more people in, one of the key triggers is uh, um, how you think about um access to the internet and access to bandwidth and so on. So there's a very interesting index. It's called the Internet Poverty Index from something called the World Data Lab. So go and look it up. The World Data Lab is a really cool um, global data site. But they have this interesting concept of measuring 
the affordability. So they look at an individual's ability to afford a basket of mobile internet. So they measure this basket by one gigabyte per month um, of data, right? At a minimum download speed of 10 megabytes per second. So they ask the question and they standardize it across all countries. What is, and then of course in PPP terms, they measure the proportion of people in a country, right? That can afford one gigabyte per month um, of data at that 10 megabytes per second um, speed. So then they ask the question, well, what percentage of people can afford it and what can't? So that then gives you what is called an internet poverty index. What they find super interesting for South Africa, right? Is that South Africa's, in, 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 in South Africa, 43% of the population, right? Um, cannot afford this basic basket of mobile internet. So 43% of South Africa's population are internet poor. So forget this glib reference, this first order thing that we've got access to telecoms, access to the internet, wherever you go in South Africa, there's access. Yeah, okay, we know that. But what about a second order question, which is, well, is everybody able to, is everybody able to afford this um, um, service that's available? And the answer is in South Africa, a large proportion, right? 43% cannot afford basic internet. And where do we rank? Well, we're the 29th highest internet poverty country in the world. And if you look at our internet poverty index compared to, right, peers that are perhaps even at lower levels of economic development than us, right, they have much lower levels of internet poverty. So for example, Colombia, who we should be compared to all the time, very similar economy, about 60 million people, upper middle income country, a fractious past, and so on, um, struggling with sort of manufacturing and a little bit of services, their internet poverty rate is 17% compared to ours at 43. And in fact, Ghana's and Nigeria's is lower than us. Where, who are our neighbors in this 43%? Gambia, Benin, and Mali. Let's think about that. So you ask the question, well, what's going on? Well, it gets really interesting, right? That differential is a lot to do with prices. So if a country is at the same level of economic development, like, uh, um, I mean, uh, you know, China, it's ridiculous. The internet poverty level in China is 2%, right? In Brazil, it's 6, right? Let's compare ourselves to Brazil. In Mexico, it's 11. We are at 43. So that the reason, let's just compare ourselves, that South Africa is so much higher than a Brazil, right? That differential it's got nothing to do with economic development because we had similar levels of economic development. So I'm not even comparing ourselves to China, right? Or Mexico, that difference has got nothing to do with economic development. What it has to do with is price differences. And so the second order challenge we have, if you want to think about not, um, not necessarily um, uh, the service provider, right, and market protection, but if you want to think about using or thinking about service costs as a cost of doing business, right, internet costs as a cost of doing business, then you have to be thinking about price differentials and the fact that South African businesses, small businesses in particular, are paying far more for internet than similar other similar developing countries. And that for me is a competitive disadvantage to many small businesses. And so in many ways, uh, this second order challenge alludes again to the kind of supply side challenges that you need to be focusing on. That if we are spending far more than other countries on um, internet and it serves as a cost disadvantage to small businesses um, uh, uh, relative to other countries, then, then that places many uh, South African companies at a, at a cost disadvantage. So that's the, the, those are the kinds of so 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 just digging a little bit deeper in terms of the outcomes from from low growth and what sustains low growth, for example, is something like um, uh, very high internet prices relative to other countries. Another second order challenge, right, is that I have referred to how the state spends similar amounts to other countries on education and schooling. Um, sorry, could you just give me one second, please? I just. Sorry, I'm in a, a venue where there's a bit of disruption, so I just asked them to 
not come in. Apologies for that. Um, so, so one of the one of the sort of references, almost glib references, we have is okay. We need to spend on education, right? So we have education spending from the fiscus, and that educational spending from the fiscus uh, is important. Well, yes, that's okay. But the second order question is to ask: Well, have we seen a return on spending on education? So, in other words, have we seen spending that is effective? Right. And that's a key question. That's the earlier point about, uh, you know, it's one thing to talk about deficits and the rise in deficits. So it narrows the fiscal envelopes. And so the st state can spend, can't spend as much on, you know, social services. Well, the other way to look at it is, is the sp state, um, is there a lot of wastage? Is the state getting its return on investment? Right. And the return on investment is, of course, the ROI measures and all sorts of measures are are very commonly used in corporate finance and in the private sector, but very seldom in public finance. And here's an ROI measure for education, right? And so the ROI measure is to look at what is called PISA scores, right? So a PISA score is a standardized test score, right? Done by all countries that participate. Uh, so it's a test score for schools, right? For schoolgoers and learners. And there's the acronym, the Program for International Student Assessment that explains it, right? Um, and it asks the question um, in these um, uh, graphs here, relative to other countries, what is South Africa's PISA score, right? The average PISA score for all our learners on average, right? Relative to, and the two graphs are relative to what South Africa spends per student on education, and relative to GDP per capita, right? So the, here's, here's the way to think about this. So let's take the GDP per capita. If we look at South Africa's GDP per capita and we compare it to a whole lot of other countries, right? South Africa basically, right, is in the same group of countries, right, that are in a sort of imaginary, let's call it a, a vertical cluster, right, that you see over here. So all these countries where my circle is sort of being, my oval circle is going, are at similar levels of GDP per capita as South Africa. Guess what? South Africa has a terrible return on investment, right, in education. Why? Because our PISA score is the lowest in the sample. We get a PISA score of about 300, but there's at least 10 other countries that are at the same level of GDP that are getting much, much higher um, uh, returns on investment, i.e. much, much higher PISA scores. And so the second order um, uh, policy question we always have to have, right? And it's and, and you can see these second order questions play themselves out in every other arena in, in, in government policy. So we often talk about metric pass rates, absolutely most ridiculously useless indicator. Metric pass rates mean nothing, right? What matters you can choose an indicator, many indicators that matter, but one of the key ones is what is the what is the university entrance pass rate, number one. Number two is what is the mathematics pass rate. Number three is make sure that the denominator is right. In other words, control for dropouts, right? So in other words, as a proportion of all students that started grade one uh, or grade R, um, uh, what was the pass rate in maths? in science and so on. So there are other ways in which you can think of second order indicators, but this clearly uh, um, shows that as a second order policy outcome, we've done really, really poorly in terms of uh, realizing returns on growth. So I think, you know, the extent to which on the macro side, we can focus on high deficits and so on. There's been far too little focus, arguably, on efficiency of spending, on returns to spending, on reducing wastage and so on. So if I could just pause there, I mean, and cobble together some of the stories. So the stories have been around a low growth rate, whether it's through, whether it's compared to other emerging markets, partly uh, politically driven, uh, uh, um, uh, hastened by the Zuma era, but also lurking behind that is a, is a premature deindustrialization trajectory. So a growth trajectory that isn't building manufacturing or low wage um, uh, low-wage, uh, labor-intensive sectors, if you like, but then a state that uses the revenue base to essentially minimize poverty and inequality, which you can understand is the mandate, if you like, of a government like South Africa's given our past, 
but has used social assistance as the easy and quick fix. So much so that it's the go-to for every sort of uh, poverty and inequality challenge, right? Um, and 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 uh, sort of a parallel track to that is that, uh, along with the rise in an environment of rising deficits, you've got a state that's not getting sufficient returns on investment, like in education, and you can look at housing and a whole lot of others. Uh, in addition, just to keep in mind, market structure matters. So I think what I've also pointed out to in terms of the internet poverty and so on is that market structure matters. If you um, and so, so with that as a background, what I've tried to do is then ask, well, and, and, and this is slightly non-traditional, right? Because I do think given the kind of challenges we face, I've asked the question, is there a way in which we can rethink our growth trajectory? Is there a way in which we can think of the path of uh, economic policy that doesn't continue on the same uh, trajectory? So there's no path dependency. Um, and and but what, what do I mean by that? Well, so the current challenge at the moment is that in this because this because our growth trajectory is so driven by social assistance, we're now sitting with the consideration that the social relief of distress grant that was introduced because of COVID must continue because we've had it. And that's a social assistance sort of mindset that, okay, this is a grant that seems to work, so we must just continue with it instead of thinking through non-revenue stress, uh, um, um, non-revenue um, uh, dependent um, interventions. So what is the first... So, so what I'm trying to suggest are what I call policy mindset shifts, and these have present, been presented to the Minister of Finance and um, um, what is called FOSAD, the sort of Forum for South African DGs. And so this hopefully will we'll try and feature this somewhere in the, in the senior policy discourse. But the first is what I've called harnessing the past for future economic policymaking. Conceptually, I want all of you, particularly on this call, to think about it in this way because you're probably the right audience. Um, you think about investments. You're associated with a financial services firm like Signia in some way. You've got probably Model C schooling. You've got a higher education and so on. And in many ways, all of us, right, or a lot of us on this call, I've given you this mathematics score here, we often focus on the average mathematics score, which is probably about quintile three, which is the dotted line here in brown. And we look at how poorly South Africa does in mathematics scores. And this is the SACMEC scores for um, uh, compared to other countries or just the average score, which is much lower than most other countries. We very seldom focus on the red bar, right? These are the quintile five, i.e. model C and private schools results. These look very, very similar, right? To a Vietnam to a uh, Brazil, um, countries that do much better than us on average in the schooling system. What it means, and just conceptually, if you think about it, a high inequality society by definition means that there's a layer of individuals and households in that society that are highly educated, that have a lot of knowledge, that have a lot of capital, of course, uh, but that's the obvious one, but they have a lot of knowledge, they have high skills. It's the kind of society where innovation can happen and does happen right, um, regularly in the South African economy. So the point about what I call the unintended consequence of a highly unequal society is that you've got these large pockets of skilled people, of quality, right, in various forms, whether it's innovation, whether it's skills, whether it's networks, um, uh, know-how, all of that exists as a pocket of um, available quality, that the state can leverage. So what do I mean? There's technical competence in all areas, right? There are retired engineers that could fix transnet. There are um, individuals in, in every sector of the economy that the state could be looking to. So the first thing to think about, right, is that you've got a highly unequal society, yes, but it's a, it's a an outcome of that, a facet of that, or manifestation of that, is this pockets of quality that can be leveraged and should be leveraged, right? So to continue with that, 
the other outcome, which we see very tangibly, right? And when I showed this to government leaders, they were shocked, right? Is this is the list of Forbes top 20,000 global companies that are South African, right? There's at least, I think it's about 12 South African companies across all, they're not all banks, right? Although a lot of them are banks, but in mining, financial services, right? Um, sorry, that should be Sassol, not Sassol. Um, uh, oil and gas, of course. And these companies are a reflection of a high inequality society. And it's a little bit of a mind shift. So what do you mean? Well, if you've got a high quality um, reservoir of skilled people with technical competence and know-how who come from good schools, those Quintal 5 schools, well, they can do great things. And so the challenge for the state is actually not to push away these uh, um, reservoirs of skills and competence, but actually to draw them in. And so the question is how? Well, the two obvious ones is partnerships at the individual level. So if you're running an SOE or a government department, look to who can, say in the Department of Health, right? Um, using skilled people, right? To engage with you from the private sector at all avenues of the private sector, um, uh, the public sector um, health system. The other way, of course, is carefully managed, and we can talk about that, but carefully managed public-private partnerships. Government may not like, you may not like it, one may not like the approach at all, but government sort of dead set against selling off all its assets, right? Uh, infrastructure assets mainly. But they're not necessarily unwilling to carefully manage public-private partnerships. So that could be commercialization. So you know, um, a freight rail line, for example, is leased out to a private um, to a private provider. That's leased out, and it's a lease that lasts for 10, 15 years, but there's an arrangement where um, some kind of income sharing occurs. In that way, the state gets a return, still owns the asset and so on, but it's not an outright sale. So those are the carefully managed public-private partnership models which the state can and should be looking at. I think under the GNU, there's a greater option for that to occur. The point is, though, the broader point, and even when you think about these partnerships with skilled retirees, so so why this arises um, and, and where the idea at least came to me was during COVID, right? So during COVID, you had a public health system, right, that was incredibly badly um, organized in terms of getting COVID medication and um, uh, so on to um, injections to um, to the poor, Right because the public health system couldn't cope with long queues of people. And so effectively large communities just effectively didn't get the vaccine. But of course, all of you know, if you are on a certain medical aid, right, you went to what looked like Switzerland, right? Very clearly um, demarcated queues in very nice gymnasiums and so on, very organized and so on. That was the private healthcare system. So you almost have a parallel system in private and public healthcare, what you did during COVID. And the idea is surely there could have been a commercialization agreement between private medical providers and the public health system to leverage off that skill set that exists in a way that benefits both parts of the society. And I think it's exactly that kind of merging of the public and the private sector um, that, that one is looking at in a way that is beneficial to both. But perhaps the most uh, I think the hardest to do, but perhaps the most important shift for government is to move away what I've called, and I've said this to the president before as well, the shift from households to firms as a policy emphasis. So what do I mean? If you've listened to my language about growth and the fiscus and fiscal support from 1994, what has happened is that government has seen the, if you like, the fight against poverty and inequality and employment generation even as occurring through the household. So all sorts of assistance has gone into old age pension, the child support grant and so on, um, as well as even when government frankly thinks about education and housing and um, electricity, they're thinking about households, right? Um, but this is not sustainable, right? Um, so so when, when one gives in a very simple way, um, and I think this audience knows that, when you give a social grant, you are effectively financing a consumption-based growth trajectory. 
when you give a social grant, I'll just repeat that, you are effectively financing a consumption-based growth trajectory. You're not financing an investment-based um, growth trajectory. And so this data here on the left gives you a very clear objective cross-country comparison of why we are far too much on a consumption-based growth trajectory rather than an investment one, is I've compared social spending. So social spending here would include um, um, uh, child support grants and old age pensions and so on. And you look at it as a percentage of GDP. Um, and, and I think there are a few other social services included. And South Africa sits very high here, right? This World Bank data. But relative to public investment, which is capital investment. So think of this as bridges, roads, ports, right? All sorts of things. Capital investment, right? South Africa's, and there's not a zero, the vertical line, South Africa's at about 2% of GDP. Compare that to China. China spends um, 8%, so, so not the lowest on social spending. So they still take care of uh, households, right? Through social spending at about 7% of GDP, but spend way more than everybody else on capital expenditure out of the fiscus. But South Africa is a complete outlier, right? Interestingly, with other Southern African countries, Namibia, Botswana, and then Bolivia, right? Uh, compared to, and here's Vietnam, my favorite one, right? So Vietnam, right? Still spending far less though, even though they, they well, they spend 6%, right? Of uh, the fiscus on on um, capital expenditure, that's three times more than us, right? And a ten percentage point difference lower on social spending. What does it effectively mean? We are on the wrong growth trajectory in terms of pivoting the fiscus away from consumption expenditure towards capital expenditure. And of course, why do we keep on talking about capital expenditure? Well, capital expenditure is what goes to the supply side of the economy. So the supply side of the economy is where firms sit, right? That's how firms across all. So when you think about firms, ladies and gentlemen, think about firms from the informal sector provider, the survivalist firm, right through to large cap firms like Signia. So think, think of firms in a very broad sense. The government, government policy at the moment or the fiscus is heavily orientated towards households, not towards firms. And it's therefore very orientated towards consumption expenditure, not capital expenditure. Yet, all jobs, right, close to 90% of all jobs in the world economy come from the private sector. Growth and jobs will come through the private sector. And so the policy moment, particularly now, requires a shift away from households towards firms. Yes, you do need to keep social assistance in, in its current form. Yes, you do need to think about households as the entry point and so on. But there's been so little emphasis on this side, right, on capital expenditure, that the shift needs to occur in some way. So we need to find a way to move at least in that direction, right? And that is what I've coined supply side economics of a good type. The problem has been partly ideological, I think, but also partly part dependency where government's view of firms is big firms, big capital, um, not good you know, um, anti-union, all sorts of ideological stuff stuck in there. And in fact, that's wrong, right? And so it's a little bit of finding a way for government to warm up to the idea. And I think it's happening definitely, um, certainly under um, the era, we've seen that with where deregulation and more supply side measures are coming uh, on stream. So this very detailed graph is actually quite simple, but hopefully gives you an idea of what I mean by supply side economics of a good type. So remember I told you think about firms as not just large firms like Signia, but also own account firms. Firms, I've got here a graph of what I, I mean, a table of what I call the firm support package matrix. So firms will 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 um, can be thought across a continuum from own account firms right through to large firms. So own account firms are those that are one person selling millies on the side of the road right through to large firms that are over 50 employees, right? So the way to think about these firms, so you just keep... The way to think about um, small and large firms is um, 
Uh, so, so this would be the one, one, one uh, person selling on the side of the road selling you millies. This would be a micro firm. Maybe there's um, a spaza shop. Uh, this is a small firm that could be a law firm, right? It could be um, uh, a parachute maker in KZN, right? Um, and it could be a furniture maker who's a medium firm, and this could be this is the large firm that we're possibly most accustomed to, right? But in each case, firms face a series of constraints. And these constraints can be thought of in the rows that I have here, such as regulation, infrastructure, supply side incentives, and human capital. So let me give you one example or, or examples that are easier to think about uh, in the case of infrastructure. When you think of infrastructure and the infrastructure needs for firms, it's also partly our own mindset as South Africans. We often think of ports or uh, energy, of course, is the most obvious one, uh, or rail or road, right? Yes, that's true. Or the cheese manufacturer in, um, I think it was uh, in Northwest, it was water, right? That was, this, that was the infrastructure constraint. But those are large firms. That's the large firms. Those are their proper constraints. And yes, they are very real. Uh, but for an owner account worker, for an informal sector operator, Actually, their infrastructure need, just have a little bit of a mindset shift, is they can't afford internet, as we discussed earlier. They have no storage space to operate, so they don't know where to put their goods at the end of a day because the local government, like the city of Cape Town or the city of Joburg, doesn't provide it to them, right? So their infrastructure needs are very, very different to a large firm. For a small firm, their regulation constraints are around what is called the extension to non-party. So the Labor Relations Act will say you're a small retailer or you're a small clothing um, um, manufacturer. The big deal that's signed between the big unions and the employers, we're going to extend that to you. It happens in the metal industry to even though you're not a party to the agreement. That's a massive red tape uh, over-regulation of the small business sector. But in, the, in each case, whether you're talking about um, uh, supply side incentives or skills or uh, regulation. In each case, there are a whole series of constraints that a firm of a different size and possibly even a different sector will face that the state needs to resolve. That's supply side economics. The state hasn't done enough of that. The state looks at micro firms and owner account firms and looks away. And instead they say, okay, how do we solve this problem of uh, employment or poverty? We go to social assistance. Wrong answer. And, 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 and that's the key way to start thinking about this. So in many ways, the, um, uh, there's a mind shift that's required. The move from households to firms is absolutely critical. The requirement that the state starts thinking about firms and the supply side as the way to unlock growth. So I want to, and I've got a few more slides before I close off, I want to sort of take you again slightly deeper into this notion of thinking about the growth trajectory um, uh, from a slightly different perspective. So we often, so one of the things, and that's the next two or three slides, one of the things I've grappled with for, for about 30 years now is that I could not understand why... Um, if you think about South Africa's unemployment challenge, uh, the uh, so it's slightly technical point, the, the output employment elasticity for South Africa, right, was very similar to a Brazil or Colombia or um, uh, India for that matter. So what I mean is for every growth, every percentage, uh, one percentage increase in GDP, um, employment went up by about 0.6%, right? 1%, so 0.6 elasticity, was very similar to Brazil or Mexico, actually, right? So why is it that we had such high unemployment levels? Didn't make sense. So we weren't particularly, we had low growth rates, yes, but so did, you know, we weren't growing, you know, Brazil wasn't growing at 10% or 12%, yet our unemployment rates were so much higher than theirs. And actually the answer has been staring at us for a very, very, in front of us. It's been right in front of us for, since democracy, right? And so here's here's this here's the answer I think right is that when you look at South Africa's share of um, when you look at South Africa's unemployment rate sorry these slides are the wrong way around when you look at South Africa's unemployment rate we're the highest in the 
um, in the sample here, right? So that's the number we always see and we say, oh my word, we need more employment growth. We've got to look at a way to create more jobs and so on. Yes, that's true. But here's the data point that's never shared together with this unemployment number. And that's this here. So if you look at the share, same sample, and if you look at the share of workers in the informal sector, South Africa's right at the bottom. So here's the weird thing, right? So, so let me extend that argument. If you look at the average middle-income country of wage employed, the ratio of wage employed to informally employed to unemployed, for every 100 workers in an average middle-income country, 45 are in wage employment, 45 are in the informal sector, and 10 are in unemployment. I'll repeat that. Average middle-income country, so any of these, Brazil, Malaysia, right? You name it. Sri Lanka, right? Um, if you take 100 people in that labor market, 45 are sitting in wage employment, they're earning wages. 45 are actually in the informal sector and 10 are in unemployment. So what about South Africa? These are all middle-income countries. They're like us, right? South Africa's wage employment is not the challenge. We have 50 out of 100 people in wage employment. That's South Africa's number there, 50. Here's the problem. We've got only 16 people in the informal sector compared to 34, therefore, in unemployment. So in fact, what happens in emerging markets, that resolves the elasticities being similar. Because you have a 0.6 elasticity that looks like Brazil, well, what's going on? Well, Brazil closes its labor market. They resolve the unemployment problem by having lots of people in the informal sector. We don't. So if you ever wondered, the visual representation is Seapoint Boulevard or, I mean, Seapoint uh, Promenade or any South African city, when people come in to from abroad, they say, wow, this looks like Europe or the US. Well, why, why do we not look like a Mexico city or um, Bogota or Sao Paulo is because the informal sector is not there or uh, Mumbai or Delhi. So you don't have large numbers of people sitting in cities who are in the informal sector. Those are those 45 people there. We may not like it visually, right? But that's how countries suppress or lower their unemployment rates. They don't do any magic with it. They just allow the informal sector to operate. A very different way to think about that. So if you don't believe me, the best way to think about this is through a cross-country regression. So we did this work, by the way, and it's a working paper that you can download on our website, um, um, uh, from my website, the DPRU website um, at UCT. Um, and it's work done with Harvard, right? So what we did is we asked the question, we ran a cross-country regression, and we had um, informality, uh, informal employment, formal employment, and unemployment as a share of the labor force. And we asked, what is given your, so given country fixed effects, controlling for country fixed effects, given your per capita income, what is the predicted unemployment rate you should have? Right. So given your per capita GDP, so it's similar to those cross-country GDP graphs, but this time in a regression context, so in a multivariate context, what should your unemployment rate be? Right. The key result we find is if South Africa, right, given South Africa's level of income, i.e. its um, its level of GDP per capita, if you like, and controlling for a country and year fixed effects, right? South Africa's implied unemployment rate for 2019, right, changes from not 26%, which is the actual rate, to about 7% of the labor force. So for South Africa's given level of GDP, we should have an unemployment rate of 7%, not 26%. Why? Because most of these people, right, should be in the informal sector. Some may be formally employed, so the model does give us that, as opposed to the averages, which suggest we have more people. But the majority of people, so this is a residual, which is the underestimate of the informal sector. The key reason explaining our high unemployment rate has got nothing to do with pure wage or poor wage employment growth. It's got everything to do with low levels of informality. I'm not asking whether you want lots of people in our cities. I think we should have it. I'm a bit unpopular about that, but... Uh, that's a separate issue. Just empirically, that's what generates our high unemployment rates. And so for me, the question then becomes, how do you think about this as a policy rethink, right? 
how do you so one of the interesting things about a country like Mexico City um, and most other developing countries, and we checked with our Harvard colleagues, um, is that there are no rules about starting a business in the informal sector. There are no rules. People walk into the city because it's open. Uh, there are no zoning laws. They may be in principle, but they're not. Um, they're not obliged to follow them, and none of the, no people follow them. And it's part of the tradition. It's part of the historical evolution of cities where the informal sector operates freely without cost. What we have is an attempt to formalize the informal sector. And I've given you here from the city of Cape Town examples of what um, uh, informal sector operators have to pay as license fees, right? And if you look at these license fees, in some cases, if you want to sell, if you want to go and hawk meals, you're spending twice as much of um, as the SRD to to operate a business. So why would you operate a business when you can get um, the social relief of the stress grant or the um, COVID grant for free? Why would you even even bother to sign try and sell anything, right? If it's sixty percent of what is free from government, so effectively what we do through a social assistance policy is we discourage opening a business. And yes, we may not think selling millies from the side of the road is opening business, but it is, right? For 60% of the population it is in most developing countries. And so you've got to start thinking about opening up the supply side of the economy at a local government level to allow businesses to breathe and to operate. And that, in my view, that that's supply side economics of a good type that actually allows the supply side of the economy, firms have lower skill levels and so on to actually operate. But there's a whole infrastructure that prevents that. There's the Business Amendment Act that disallows people to, to just operate anywhere. So it prevents, so there's zoning laws effectively, right? Then they, uh, those are supplemented by licensing fees, which you see here. There's no infrastructure. So people would come into the cities. And, you know, the point I always make is if you go to New York City, the hot dog seller has more infrastructure than an informal sector worker in South Africa. In New York City, the hot dog seller gets a perfectly um, designed uh, hot food stand to operate a business. That's small business development, right? But we don't have that in South Africa. We also have township dwellers living very, very far away from where rich consumers are, i.e. in cities. And there's also high crime, which prevents businesses from operating. So all of these obstacles um, exist, but many of them, particularly the first three or four, are path dependent from a history of all um, governments since 94 and local governments viewing the informal sector as um, uh, a part of the economy that needs to stay away. And I think that's a mindset that that does need to change. So I'm almost there. In terms of other innovations around the supply side, so the informal sector is absolutely critical for me. It's non-traditional. It's not what we like to think about. It's not large capex, fancy um, investments. It's not uh, restructuring ports. All of that must happen and should happen. But I think the answer is almost right under our nose in terms of if you wanted an outcome that generated uh, sufficiently large reductions in unemployment. So another supply side measure is one that we've used already. So if you recall, we had something called TERS, right? TERS was the temporary employment relief scheme that ran through the UIF during COVID. What did the TERS policy do? It basically provided wage subsidies to firms that were in distress during COVID. There was a massive transfer from the unemployment insurance fund, which is still solvent, right? It's because they had massive reserves that were in part being abused, frankly. Um, and we used it for pivoting it towards um, firms in need on a mass scale, right? What did the TERS do? The careful data shows that the TERS saved 2.7 million jobs during this period, right? And the average job... Um, Saved cost of uh, the UIF in this case about thirteen thousand two hundred rand per month, right? Um, and it was progressive in nature, so so lower wage workers got more as a percentage, and so on. Um, the point is not to reintroduce the ter terse as terse on a mass scale because the UIF will go insolvent; it will be actuarially not viable. But the point is to think about wage subsidies as a potential supply side option for firms in distress. So the state is never available to support firms that are in distress. 
but the UIF is there, right, to do that precisely. So I often think of the furniture industry as a really good example. So the furniture industry is a medium skilled uh, industry that's struggling on the back of, in the face of Chinese imports, um, but employs in rural KZN large numbers of African female low to medium skilled um, workers. So this is an industry that you know the state would want to protect, yet the state has done nothing. This is an industry in distress. Why not pivot wage subsidies of some form in a structured way to firms in furniture, for example, that are in true distress if tariff lines can't be increased to protect uh, those firms from Chinese imports, which incidentally is exactly what the Chinese do. So that's an example, again, of of innovation in policy directed towards the supply side of the economy. Um, the last one I've, I've got is innovation that, again, government doesn't like to think about. Um, sorry, let me just, government doesn't like to think about because it seems like it's too fiddly, right? But it's about placing, so if you think about the unemployed, there's a, there is a, there is a layer of the unemployed that cannot find jobs even though they are educated. So there's no structural challenge. So it's not like they can't get into urban areas and so on. They just can't find a job despite having uh, a degree and so on. And those are individuals that are common, right, in other developing countries um, because the labor market isn't matching them well enough. And often what happens is the a public sector, they call them placement services, right, career guidance services, um, job agencies around the world, usually run by the state, but not always, will find you a job, right? In the old days, there was a company called Kelly Girl, right? Remember that rather sexist term, but they would place people and so on, right? So that's what a placement agency does. And they are public placement agencies run by government around the world. South Africa spends 76 times less on public employment services than Brazil. So we complete in the most high unemployment society in the world, we are not even trying to match the unemployed to, to workers. It's one of the reasons why a private NGO like Harambi, somebody who may have, some of you may have heard of it, is doing such a fantastic job in placing workers because the state is terrible at it, right? And they've got a very careful model in making sure that the match rate is high by matching um, the unemployed to, to employers very, very carefully. It's not, a, it's not a perfect solution for all the unemployed, but those that have a low, what we call a low gap between demand and supply, so maybe a skills top up is required and so on, those individuals can be placed quite easily. Yet the state has very little emphasis on what, what I would call a, 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 an active labor market policy. So there's another, those are just two or three simple innovations that are required in areas that we don't often think about. So let me just pause there and say, you know, I've, I've covered a lot of detail and a lot of um, different topics, but the, but hopefully the spine is clear and the spine is driven by short and long run factors, right? So we've, we've, um, we, we, we've reached a period now, a threshold of what is clearly 30 years of insufficient growth rates, right? And what they've delivered is high debt costs, a dependence in a growth trajectory um, uh, that's social assistance heavy uh, and supply side light, um, not a focus enough on firms, too much on households, um, and arguably uh, that has generated insufficient employment, even aggregate employment, never mind informal and informal uh, employment, amidst an ongoing structural challenge of premature deindustrialization. If the state is able to unlock and leverage off the expertise in the private sector, if it's able to make the switch from households to firms, I would arguably say through policy innovation that focuses on the supply side, uh, I think we can appreciably look at uh, a more positive growth outcome. All right. Thank you very much for that. Um, I'm going to pause and I see there are uh, questions. Yes, so Chris Gilmore, um, good to have you online. Um, yes, internet service providers have always been very expensive um, in South Africa. Elon Musk, Starlink, yes, agree, right? Um, so I think there is a discussion where, you know, if Starlink comes in, can there be a more innovative 
public-private partnership or a more friendly discussion with Starlink. I don't know the details of it, but I would argue that's exactly it. But then, Chris, actually one of the reasons, I mean, part of the solution lies with the ISPs themselves, right? That why is it um, that a country uh, as large as India or Colombia or Brazil can be so much cheaper than ours? And there's a lot about competition policy and um, price regulation um, uh, uh, that the ISPs need to answer for. Um, yes, so anonymous attendee, yes. Um, the telecoms and the internet poverty issue is is massive and it does. So what, you know, we, we can think of it in terms of households, but you're right, it is about small businesses as well. So let's, let's park that for now and think of a supply side measure. One key supply side measure would be to go uh, very hard at ISPs in respect of um, packages being offered to small businesses. That would be one clear deregulation, if you like, that one can think of, apart from labor deregulation. Um, so the question is, are the social relief programs sustainable in the medium to long term? Uh, so, so that debt to GDP uh, trajectory uh, assumes, so because it's part of the medium term expenditure framework, it does assume um, inflationary adjustments to social assistance. But what you can, I mean, it's so, yes, it's, is it sustainable? It'll remain. But what starts happening, and this is the point, right? What starts happening if growth starts declining or interest rate costs on debt start increasing? So the interest bill as part of the fiscus goes up is effectively real values. And you've already seen, been seeing it happening for old age pensions and the child support grant is that real values of these grants go down. So it stays in place, but effectively you see a deterioration in the, um, in the value of the grant. Um, is the Gini coefficient a realistic measure of inequality? Um, yes. So, oh, that's, I didn't talk about inequality. So, um, Yes and no, the Gini is the easiest to, to measure and understand. The Gini is very heavy in its um, uh, reflection of those individuals in the middle of the distribution rather than the tails. So there's something called the generalized entropy measures, a little bit of a technical thing. So, And those bias the weights of the distribution to those at the top and the bottom end. So you can get better measures um, than the, the Gini. And yes, uh, China's Gini coefficient has gone up. That's for sure. Um, a long question from or two questions from Mark. Um, brand depreciation, cost of living. Yeah, so I mean, I think uh, you definitely. So there's partly partly the inflationary dynamic is built into the growth story because we take real GDP, right, and so that's. Um, uh, so, so that, that again, so as we talk about, yes, cost of living has gone up and so on. The real, the real question is, has real GDP gone up, right? Um, or real GDP per capita. And if you compare us to middle income countries, um, that gap has grown. And I think that's, that's the real way to think about. It. So let's take inflation out, right? And let's look at in real terms, what's happened. And in real terms, yes, we've been growing, but growing much slower, uh, than other emerging markets. And, and I think that's the real, if you like, comparator to think about, that in a uh, cross-country comparison, um, South Africans have been getting poorer relative to other emerging markets. Um, yeah, so interest rates are key uh, in an environment that's going to hopefully encourage private sector investment. I think that's the... Um, uh, but 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 you know the Reserve Bank currently is very uh, watchful of inflationary expectations, which don't seem to be settling, and uh, the governor in particular would like to see us moving below four and a half percent at least before he starts thinking about interest rates. And of course, we tend to follow the U.S., so I think the U.S. is the one to follow and to watch in terms of interest rate cuts. Um, yeah, and so I agree, uh, Mark. Your question is: we, we, I think these kinds of hopefully deep dives are important because you start thinking about the long run growth trajectory rather than you know, okay, in the next quarter growth rates have suddenly gone up because there's been a turnaround in mining or something. I think those are important, but 
these from time to time are really useful as sort of longer term growth trajectory discussions. Um, um, so how sorry, there's a lot of questions. I'm trying to get households to firms. Um, yes, so that's the idea. So you shift from seeing households as consumers to see them as productive units. Exactly. So that's the idea, right? So you can get, I mean, the individuals who live in households, I guess that's just a emblematic way to think about, you know, don't think about getting grants into households, get, think about getting wage subsidies to firms or storage facilities to firms, um, even though they may be one and the same individual. Um, uh, yes. Um, So pre-94, what did this formal, informal, non-working metric look like? The problem is, I, uh, this is from an anonymous attendee, we don't have data pre-94, but I would, you know, and that's very strange because, you know, we didn't have a normal society. So, uh, you know, black people couldn't live in cities, couldn't move into cities. So you don't have a spatial, so you can, you can definitely not operate an informal economy and so on. But I think what what's important about your question is that it's part of this non-traditional city that we have that looks more like a Europe rather than Sao Paulo um, is because of our past. So we don't have a, um, um, it's not embedded in the society to think about the informal sector as being everywhere in a city, right? Whereas it's very normal in most developing countries, cities, as I'm sure many of you have seen. Um, um, so government grants, the money flows so those are important questions, but a lot of the money flows directly into consumption, right? So 70, 80, 90% of it goes into, um, into retail. And essentially that's fine, right? Um, but it's not a long-term solution uh, to, it's a consumption-based or consumption-driven fiscal policy rather than investment-driven. Yes, the design, so... Uh, Merle, November, a good question on legacy apartheid, the design of living areas. I think that's fundamentally important. I didn't mention that. So one of our the challenges of the Group Areas Act is that you still have what, what economists call spatial dislocation. So black people um, still live furthest away from the cities, right? And that's very unusual compared to other developing countries. And so transport costs not only are high, but if you think you're moving businesses or business moving into an urban area, even if the if the city government provides uh, infrastructure and so on, it's very costly. And so one doesn't need to think almost so often when we talk about the informal sector amongst economists, and in fact, even say World Bank type economists, they would say, well, from the sounds of it, this is more about urban development rather than just economic. So, you know, it's not just about providing, reducing license fees. You have to think about urban infrastructure and so on. And I think that's, um, that's a really important um, uh, way to think about it. Um, so Chris, Chris has come back. So the uh, best estimate of the total size of the informal sector. Ooh, so the informal sector is about 15%. Um, if you go by my, so 16% of the labor force. Um, and so that gets us, I need to get you an exact number, but that gets us to about six, three, four, five million or something. I, I need to give you an exact number. Um, but that's the key point is that 16% of, um, of the labor force, uh, that's just, you know, compared to 45, right, percent in the average emerging market, that's the smoking gun, if you like. Um, yes, so um, there's a question about the informal sector. So again, it's also a lot of it is to do with vendors and city officials and mainly the police in fact who view people trying to make a living and and in fact the president referred to it in the sona a few years back that they are aggressively removed so they're seen as a crime issue rather than or, or a nuisance issue rather than um, individuals trying to make a living yeah so a lot of so the question so there is support from government but I think the difficulty is in implementation because, in fact, it's not the Minister of Finance who gets to decide how to fix the informal sector. It's it's a city government official. And so and that's really difficult. So that can't just happen by fiat uh, at the national level. It needs to happen through um, 
urban authorities and the urban authorities need to be empowered, need to understand, need to accept it and so on. Um, but but we're plugging away. Um, okay, I think I've covered, all, I've tried to cover all the questions. Um, there are lots of them. Um, but, uh, sorry, there's one from um, Pumlile from Signia. So let me give her the last word. So Pumlile says um, that there should be a shift in policy away from consumption-based economy. And right, would you then say that given the nature of unlisted investments, that we should relook at how defined contribution funds are invested into unlisted markets? Yes. So I think that's a big leap, right, Pumlile? From here, so I don't think we're talking about pivoting investments um, necessarily in this direction. I think that's a separate discussion where in the unlisted space, especially if these are savings of pensioners, uh, future pensioners and so on, you do need a far more careful uh, measurement tool for the returns that these uh, um, uh, savers will get, right, on their funds. And I think that's a discussion that the DTIC has recently opened by saying, okay, we should be looking at infrastructure and changing regulation 28 and so on. I think that's a long road, but I think it, it is a market that can be developed as long as there's certainty in the, in the return. The problem has been that um, certainly during the Zuma years, you wouldn't know whether all of this money would disappear down the drain, right? VBS style. style. And so I think that trust first needs to be rebuilt before you can have any discussion about um, understood investments through um, um, uh, through assets under under management. Okay, well, thank you very much, everybody. I hope this was interesting and useful, and I look forward to engaging at the next webinar. Thanks very much.